Good evening and welcome to the Lake Oswego Public Library Third Tuesday Author Series, which is generously sponsored by the Friends of the Library. My name is Alicia Yokoyama, and I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's authors, Ben Hodgson and Laura Moulton, who are here to present their book, Loners, The Making of a Street Library. In 2011, Laura Moulton founded Street Books, a mobile library serving people living outside in Portland, Oregon. That summer, Ben Hodgson's became one of her most dedicated regulars, setting the still unbroken single season record for borrowing. Then Ben's routines changed and he didn't cross paths again with Laura for almost two years. Loners is the story they began to tell when they reconnected, offering a street level perspective of a community whose stories are seldom told. Alternating between their two unforgettable points of view in this addictively readable, occasionally sublime memoir. Please give a warm welcome to Ben Hodgson and Laura Moulton. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Thank you for the, the silent claps, everyone. Um, we're kind of used to it by now in the Zoom world. Um, well, we want to just thank you all for coming. We want to thank Alicia for this kind invitation. And uh, Hodge and I published this book on October 5th, and we've been very lucky to take part in some very cool events since then, but we have also done a lot on Zoom, and so we're used to this format. And we just appreciate people coming on an evening um, and putting your face back into a screen. That is no small sacrifice these days. And so we really appreciate it and we can't wait to see you in person. Um, what we thought we would do is um, alternate a few vignettes from the book and then allow time for a conversation or for questions. And so Hodge is going to lead us off. Um, if you're not familiar with the book, um, it's called Loners, the Making of a Street Library, and it alternates between our two perspectives, pretty short little passages. And so um, Hodge will go first. You ready, Hodge? I am. <clears throat> and this is a section uh, it's called Equipage Pathé Key. I had been outdoors for about nine months by then and still hadn't recovered from the nasty shock of falling into the bottom of the barrel and then seeping on down through the cracks. I slept in Old Town with a few spare clothes and a couple of blankets. Most nights, the sidewalks from the bridge and around Second Avenue to Cooch were haphazardly strewn with various specimens of humanity, some of whom a chagrined creator might have called failed experiments. I was usually the third or fourth experiment down from the mission. To a new guy, just finding a spot was a source of anxiety. I soon worked out a simple four-step routine. Breakfast at the mission, 7 a.m. Kill time. Dinner at the mission, 6 p.m. Find a spot on the sidewalk. This was challenging wasn't two weeks before I was on Burnside over the Max tracks when Andre Payton came to a bad end, corner of Second and Cooch. They counted dozens of bullets. Welcome to Old Town. There were a few day doorways on third between Cooch and Davis. Good rain spots, availability various. I commandeered one of them and it turned into my spot, even though there is really no such thing as a reserved spot. Think this one over. If you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you can go to one of the nearby Johns, and when you get back, maybe some of your stuff is missing. Or you can take everything with you, and when you get back, maybe someone is in your spot. Or you can just give up and let fly whenever and wherever you have to. What I had taken to doing was not drinking anything past about noon. Not the healthiest approach, but it does show initiative and employers take that into consideration. Gotta hand it to the cops. It was fairly slick how they did it. Showed up about 4 a.m. and started rousting people one at a time handing out exclusions, so you don't even know they're there until it's your turn. You see, under the bridge is considered part of Waterfront Park. Park closes at midnight. So now I couldn't be in the park, any part of it, day or night, 
for six months. Bummer. Didn't know where I was going to sleep, so I went back to the sidewalks around the mission and the overflow under the bridge at the Skidmore Max stop near the mission. Under the bridge, there were some aggressive types, usually the drinkers, that got belligerent, and it was a creepy place in general. That night, there was a confrontation. I overheard that sounded like someone had pulled a knife because I heard a girl say, do it, you don't have the balls. Then I heard the sound of someone falling down. I heard these things, but I did not lift my head to see what was happening. Somebody stole a bike right in front of me the next night. I had heard a couple of guys talking about the bike earlier when locking it up for the night on one of those hitching posts. The owner was only about 20 feet from me on the sidewalk there on second. Late that night, I woke to see a couple of people there by the bike, one of them with a pair of bolt cutters at work on the chain. I heard the chain give way and a girl's voice say, yeah, they walked off with it. You have to be impressed at my courage. I never made a sound. Seems despicable, but stick around, it gets better. Not long after the bike theft, I saw a guy step over the seawall along the Willamette, just north of Burnside, and look around, thinking it over. I walked right on past and on down to my usual bench and opened my book. When I looked back, there was no one there. I didn't even check to see if he had jumped. He had or if somebody should make a phone call or something. They fished him out. What was I supposed to do, get involved? I wouldn't have known whether to try and talk him out of it or ask him to save me a seat. So my section is called The Road. As I passed by Skidmore Fountain, a firefighter named Fred, strawberry blonde hair and freckles, leaned over the fence at the fire station and asked what I was doing. It's a street library, I said. How do you decide what books to offer, he asked. I try to offer a little bit of everything, I told him. I understand that a man living outside might not want to unwind with a Jane Austen novel. Fred grinned and leaned in closer. I am such a fan of Jane Austen, he said. Don't tell the guys here, and he hooked a thumb back toward the fire station, but I've read every one of her books. I had decided to use an old school card and pocket system in each book so people could sign the books out. I also had little street books cards to issue each person on which I'd write their name and my location and hours. The book bike was heavy on the uphill and I was relieved when I arrived at the park blocks for the second library shift in Southwest Portland near the art museum. I stopped under a canopy of trees to avoid the drizzle. Once the brakes were set, I pulled out the drawer and propped it up with a wooden block. Wiping raindrops from the books with the cloth, I took stock of my surroundings. The square drew many different kinds of people, scrappers with their skateboards and dogs on hemp leashes, gauges and ears, tattoos, pierced eyebrows, tongues, cheeks, a white haired man, beard yellowed by nicotine, selling homemade wooden walking sticks. Guys with oversized backpacks at the north end of the square sat smoking and talking. The kids with dogs sprawled on the grass not far from me. People wandered through the, from the nearby farmer's market carrying baguettes and flowers leading small children or balancing on rollerblades. I confess I was nervous. What if nobody out here really wanted a book? There was also a small voice in me that said, really, a book? Somebody has been sleeping on a piece of cardboard on the concrete for months and what you've got to offer is a paperback? It had occurred to me that a person who had been on the road for months or years might not enjoy reading The Grapes of Wrath. My first patron wasn't a patron at all, but a security guard named A.B. He studied my contraption, scanned the titles in the library, and then asked for my permit. I don't think I need a permit if I'm not selling anything, I told him. He chewed on this information for a few minutes, circled the bike, and then shrugged. He rested his hand on the edge of the bike box and settled into a comfortable lean. I get notions to read stuff, he said, like books about secret government doings and everything that we're not supposed to know. But he said he rarely finished a book before getting distracted on account of his busy brain. Just when I began to wonder if his uniformed presence at the library might hurt my business, he wished me luck and pushed off. With A.B. gone, I screwed up my courage and approached the group of young people sprawled on the grass. Hey guys, I'm operating a library for people who live outside. You should come have a look at the books if you like. I handed out street books cards to each person. 
Thomas was one of the first from the group to amble over and inspect my collection. Up close, I saw that he had sea blue eyes that were both spooky and beautiful, and his chin and neck were tattooed with dark blue designs. I take requests if you have any, I said. He studied me for a moment. I've been meaning to read Cold Mountain by Charles Frazier. Whatever I might have supposed about a young man wearing mostly black with tattoos on his face and neck and gauges in his ears, it wasn't that he'd been meaning to read a retelling of the Odyssey set during the American Civil War. I realized I needed to keep my mind open and make no assumptions about what a patron might want to read or about who they were. Nothing was a given. Each person a walking his secret history. It was up to them how much they revealed. Back to you, Hodge. Okay, this is a little section called GQ. At first, she looked like any other street librarian, complete with the cards in the books and post-it notes and paper clips. Bicycle parked and little shelf pulled out, displaying the collection. I graciously overlooked the complete lack of any Woodhouse titles on her shelves, but did mention in passing that a well-maintained library does require some attention. Only too late what I learned that here was a teacher turned recalcitrant school child that refuses to do her assigned reading. But I didn't know that yet. I'd arrived in my ratty looking coat, scruffy beard, hair going every which way, like I'd just stepped off the cover of Gentleman's Quarterly and then into a threshing machine. The way I must have looked to Laura at the street library, it could easily have been straight out of Woodhouse. Describing one of Bertie's lovesick acquaintances, he writes, he looked like a character in one of those Russian novels, trying to decide whether to murder several relatives before hanging himself in the barn. This part is called The Second Shift. The next week, it was still misty and cool as I set the library up alongside Skidmore Fountain. There were police officers on horses posing for pictures with a gaggle of elementary school children. One kid could not get over the horses and kept reaching up as if to hug one around the neck over the protestations of his teacher. After the students lined up and followed their teacher away, the officers roused a row of people along the fountain where they slept, hedged in by shopping carts covered in blue tarp, a tangle of clothing and bedding and arms. I watched as they groggily assembled their belongings. A young man in white stocking feet stared blankly at the bike library and then went back to stuffing his gear into a plastic bag. My first customer of the day was a man wearing red horn-rimmed glasses and a beard on the edge of feral. His hair grew just past his collar and were he to trade his shabby gray coat for a tweed jacket and his brown paper bag for a leather briefcase, it would have been easy enough to imagine him at the lectern of a university classroom. By now the sun had burned off the mist and the day was warm. Come have a look at these books, I said. I'm running a free library. You check them out and then return them the next week, same place, same time. I think Hodge has one more to close. Yeah, we'll wrap it up quickly here, uh, keeping it mercifully brief. <clears throat> Should I tell it? I rode the bus to Merrillhurst for one of Laura's night classes and I read from my Street Roots article, then answered questions. One of her students wanted to know if Laura ever account encountered someone who made her uneasy, especially since she was hanging a shingle out in the midst of the disenfranchised, drawing attention to herself. And compare and contrast that to me and whoever made me uneasy. It was the kids giving the teacher an essay question. I asked Laura if she remembered the mythology girl and should I tell it? Yes and yes, she said, so I told them. There was a young lady, obviously very happy, who waltzed and pirouetted around the library premises and asked about a mythology book. We may or may not have been uneasy in the same way that she may or may not have had more than just blood in her bloodstream. I looked for a mythology title or related subject and finding neither quickly suggested she might prefer something else. 
She looked at us with her larger eye and said, do you know what was left in Pandora's box after all the troubles of the world flew out? I didn't know, and I looked at Laura, and she didn't know. It was hope, she said, hope and hope alone, all by itself. And she waltzed off, leaving us with nothing. <sighs> and that, uh, by the way, I thought I would add, everything in here is factual. If we took liberties with the order or the sequence, it's still largely factual, except that one story that I just read. There was no such exchange at the library. I left it in for a few reasons. Uh, I had only recently learned myself that hope was what was left in Pandora's box. And I dedicated the book to my sister, Bonnie Hope Hodgson, and the hope theme. You're living outdoors, it's hard. Hope is a valuable commodity. And if the book might gives people something to look forward to, then good for us. <sighs> Thanks, Hodge. So I You're think welcome. we're we're so welcome. I mean, we're we're so open rather to uh, questions people have. Um, if you've read the book and have a question about the book, or if you have a question about the street library itself. Um, hit us, I think, in the chat, or it's a, it seems like a small enough group that you could unmute and just um, talk. Well, I guess I'll kick it off. Is there a, is there a, um, Laura, is a book or a, a genre that was particularly favored by your um, patrons? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. You know, um, we we found some standards like um, Louis L'Amour and sort of Western uh, Westerns in general, um, outdoor books, adventure books, John Krakauer books, things like that. James Patterson is a very popular author on The Shift. But we also found enormous range and diversity in what people wanted, which I guess, you know, it goes without saying because of the enormous range of people uh, that encountered the library. Um, but Hodge has a good uh, story about someone who rejected a book. Do you want to tell it, Hodge? Well, I will, but first I'll say the obvious ones, Stephen King, John Grisham, and the popular authors. There's a reason they're popular. They're, they're readable. Um, the guy that did not check out the Nietzsche book because it was the wrong translation. Um, this guy's in a league by himself. I, I can't touch this guy. Um, yeah. Uh, and some people, they just surprise you. I had a book about the, the crops, the arms manufacturer, and the guy looked at it, and he knew their history, uh, how, they, how they used to work it. They worked the balance of power, and they would sell weapons to to uh, different countries based on, uh, to keep the trade going. Uh. Yeah, and I would just add that it was interesting because I met Hodge um, in 2011, my very first summer out with the library. This was an art project turned um, long-term investment. Um, and, and I remember that I could tell right away that he, well, he, for one thing, he busted my chops when he saw no PG Woodhouse. So I knew already that I was on, you know, on his list, but then I could tell he was a real reader and he was, you know, much better read than I was um, in some genres. And so every week he sort of weighed whether to take what he knew was edifying for himself or what would kill the afternoon. And sometimes he took a little bit of both, you know. So, yeah, thank you for that question, Courtney. My memory in reading the book was that there were quite a few requests for poetry that you seem to, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. I guess that surprised me, and yet um, it seems to feed something. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that that question. I think you know we 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 have a real range um, when it comes to poetry as well, and it might be. Um, a popularity of shorter pieces and and um, something like Chicken Soup for the Soul that are sort of motivational, small vignette style pieces. Um, but then we also had people that were very hungry for 
um, all kinds of poetry and, um, you know, Mark Strand to Alice Walker to um, Mary Oliver. And a lot of the time I think um, people would request something generally but not really know beyond that favorite title or author. And we would just try to stock it with such a range of beautiful things. Poetry is a favorite of ours. And so, um, and they're very light, inter, you know, um, easy volumes to stick on a library. Um, and so we often would um, have spontaneous readings at the bike library, you know, people pouring over their books. Um, or we also, um, we've, we've been able to use um, poetry from local writers, like um, the native writer, Ed Edmo, who's uh, mm -hmm. based in Portland and who himself lived outdoors for about 12 years. He, um, he has a cool little chapbook that we've bought a bunch of um, for the shift because his poems are, are really popular. So yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, I think, I think of, that's my personal bias is poems as sort of balm for, you know, our raw feelings and, or for an articulation or a distillation of what has happened in a day or nature. And so I think that it's been, it's been very popular. And again, as I read in the section where the kid surprised me when he requested Cold Mountain, um, we find that unlikely sorts will take a volume of poems back to their campsite, you know, which is a good reminder to us always. So, yeah. Thanks for that question, Lynn. I had wondered if we weren't being kind of indulgent going up to pals and buying books that somebody requested. A guy said, he's much younger than me. He grew up with Eminem in the same way that I cut my teeth on the Beatles and the Stones. And somebody picked him up an Eminem book. I saw him up reading it where he hung out at. And I wondered if we aren't being indulgent until one day I was at Sisters of the Road and Michelle, uh, you got to her Paulo Coelho book. And when she saw that book, the way her face lit up, I just go, okay, I asked the question and I think I'm looking at my answer. Do the request. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's definitely a very sweet part of the street library, which is inviting people to make a request and then doing our very best to, to bring that book to the same place and same time the next week in hopes of connecting with that person. And so we talk a little bit about that in, in the book, these near misses and, you know, the tragedy of getting a book like a raw foods cookbook for a kid and then looking for him for the rest of the summer and not finding him um, and then encountering him. And so, you know, there are also miraculous connections made, but, um, but that is a very special part because I think that a lot of our patrons are, have had a very, you know, tough stretch of time. And when someone calls them by name and greets them warmly and says, hey, I've got this, uh, this book for you, there is a kind of, you know, moment where they're, they, they feel seen and, and have had somebody thinking about them during the week and delivering this. So I think that's a pretty key part of the library. And I wouldn't have thought of that, you know, piece of it being so essential when when we first launched that first summer so yeah I have another request story it just came to my mind Vitaly came by at Blanche house <clears throat> and asked if we had a bible in Russian I said well we don't but Powell's has a language section I'll go up and check it out and he came by the next shift and ask again about it. And I said, oh man, I forgot. I didn't get up there Thursday for sure. And so that very day I went up to Powell's. Well, they didn't have a Bible in Russian, but they did have Huckleberry Finn in Russian. They had uh, Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground in the original language and some other Russian writer that I had never heard of. And the next time he came by, I gave him all three of them and he was happy with I think we still have a picture of him holding all three of them up. We do. Probably the combination of the three was kind of biblical, if you think about it, Hodge. So you technically fulfilled the request, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I just want to thank you for the book. It's great. I'm Terry, you know. <gasps> Yay, Terry. <laughs> so great. We haven't met um, in person, so that's good. I know. I've given away a few copies. I'm sure I'll buy some more to give out on the bike this summer. Um, 
my big thank you to you is the tip about having reading glasses. Yeah. Because I, I was reaching out to our homeless this year, this past summer and a few guys were taking books and one older guy's like, I don't read. Just kind of, you know, I hadn't met him before. He's, I don't read. And for whatever reason, I didn't let it go. I said, can you not? I said, can you not read? Do you just not like it? Or is it your eyes? He said, oh, it's my eyes. So I said, I got these. And he took a book and took glasses. And the next week it said, I crushed them. Do you have any more? <laughs> so oh, this year I'm looking for hard cases too. Well, and Terry, do you want to say something? This is so exciting to have you on. I really appreciate you <laughs> attending. And do you want to say something about what you're doing in Wisconsin? Yeah, I'm in La Crosse, Wisconsin, west coast of Wisconsin. Um, I have Paperback Rider, definitely inspired oh. by Laura. I had read an article years ago. I, I started it on just my bicycle with a huge basket. Um, it'll be four years this year. And... We just got our 501c3 status this winter, and now it's getting scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've given out, I think, just over 2,200 books, not counting, oh. like, bulk to, like, you know, somebody local had a little free library in their yard and ran out of kid books, and we brought, you know, a box of 50. I don't count those. I just count them if they go from my hand to somebody. One day, I'm going to get back out to Portland. See you guys. I know. Well, we're we're threatening to have an international street librarian conference. Um, and yeah, you had mentioned that first one you... on Zoom. So, but yeah. we'll be in touch because that's the plan. We're thinking fall. We're thinking September. So, we'll let you awesome. know. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to this. It's so fun to meet you in person. That's the bizarreness. Likewise. Just email and letter correspondence so far. Yeah. Yeah, so you inspired me, and then I there's another guy who saw what I was doing, and he had a couple of book bikes, and I've had a couple other people ask. So, so cool that it, you know we have um, conversations with people. We've got an official street library, sister library in Texas, in Austin, Street Books ATX, um, and then many other cool little um, projects similar that you know uh, that were in contact years ago and have built their own creative um, you know, engagements in their cities, which is so cool. And I think that that's, that would be my fondest hope is that every city has a street library and then it's gradually just not, um, you know, not as relevant or not as needed anymore because people are inside. I mean, I think that street libraries, it would be great to have them proliferate forever, but to have people come from their nice little apartments or um, yurts or whatever, however, um, huh whatever structure they want to check out a book and have a great conversation, you know, and then go back inside, go back into to, uh, a roof. Um, other questions? Oh my gosh, I have to say, I see people I know and love, Ariel from Canada and Laura Glazer from Portland and my mom and dad, and maybe James Moulton, my brother, James M, who built the original bike, I have to say. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, Laura. Um, who, what's the response been to the artwork on the front and spine and, you know, the general feel of the book? How have readers responded? You know, I think people have really loved it. And I, I'm, a, I'm such a fan of the cover because it is uh, the core, it's an illustration of the corner where Hodge um, lived for a period of time in Old Town um, outside the vacant Chinese food restaurant. And what's so cool about the, the small bits, I don't know if you can see on my copy, but there are windows, there are rather um, posters that have been taped up. And those are impressionist, impressionist paintings that Hodge actually found in a free box, scissored out and um, taped up in this, on this corner. Do you want to say more about it, Hodge? You have the better backstory. Uh, yeah, I found uh, the Impressionists and I got some duct tape and started taping them using the duct tape to simulate frames and had them, people, tourists were actually coming by taking pictures of it because there was a girl that panhandled down the corner and sat there most of the day and she told me she saw him doing it. And one day the local cleanup crowd, clean and safe, <laughs> came by and tore them all down. Uh, sorry, nothing beautiful is permitted in Old Town. 
<laughs> and they just they tore the paintings down and left the ugly looking frames up. Uh, I cried myself to sleep that night. <laughs> what do I got to do? But it looked good for a while, and nothing lasts forever. So, yeah, and I would just say um, uh, to your point, Laura, about the the response of the book and the art. The we were so lucky to work closely with um, the artist um, Aaron Miller, who is a printmaking artist in town, and he really sat down with us. He read the book sat down and listened to Hodge and I took a bunch of notes and then biked to the various locations and just sat and sketched in his notebook. And so we were actually really, the day we gathered in the yard and spread the, the various samples out on the grass, it was very hard to choose um, what, what would felt the best. But in, in the end, I loved this the very most. And Hodge, when he saw that that was my first vote, crossed over and voted with me. So so we, and in that way, we had a, a lot bigger say as writers than um, a lot of times writers do when it comes to publishing a cover. And I think um, that is a testament to Michael Heald, who's our editor and publisher uh, with Perfect Day Press, who's here in Portland. So the idea, the fact that we went with a local project um, or a local publisher was huge in us having a say. And we love the art. I mean, I just feel so grateful. It's it feels so aesthetically appropriate for street books, you know, which has always been scrappy. And so something that was a little bit DIY in nature was really exciting to us. Yeah, thanks. So I, I have another question. Yeah. Um, so Laura, I actually know you from, um, I was in one of your classes at Lewis and Clark in, yes. the, in the before times in the yes. teacher program. And um, so my question is, I mean, I didn't think I could write on day one. And by day three, I'm like, yeah, I, I can do this. Um, so my question for you is, is any, and Hodge as well. So Hodge has become a writer or maybe you were before, I, I don't know. But have you had some of your other patrons um, decide to write because of your interaction with them? That's a great question. And thank you, Courtney. I knew I knew you and it was oh. like, oh man. Um, <laughs> But it was the before times. Hodge, do you want to say anything about that? Like your own well, history? I honestly don't know. I just, I simply do not know if anybody's tried to write because of this. Boom, boom, boom. But in your own case, like, did you write, you wrote on and off before we encountered each other, right? Oh, I had a notebook full of, you know, I've never had any, tried to get anything published. I just sort of kept notes. And, no, I never really wrote much of anything. Uh, a guy on the street is taking the journalism class in street routes. I don't know if that counts. Yeah, that's that's um, that's a very cool project. It's called Mojo uh, Mobile Journalism, and that's something Street Roots is piloting um, for folks that want to learn more about telling stories and and writing. But I would say um, we have we just hired a new librarian um, who is living in a in the navigation center. He's staying right now. So he is off. He was sort of camping and moving around and he's um, moved into a shelter that's the, the navigation center is the one under the Broadway bridge. And uh, he's, a, he's great. He's just helping us out um, right now getting ready for summer shifts, but he's a great writer. And he actually has a um, kind of um, self-published um, collection of writings that is available at Hawthorne Powell's. Um, and I think that that's something that is so cool and is such a testament to Portland that um, people, regardless of where they happen to live or how much money they have, might um, be able to have a self-published thing at our local independent bookstore. So that is a very cool thing. Um, and I would say we also have um, blank books and small notebooks and journals very in, um, periodically we'll have a stack of those and those are very popular. So we make sure that we have a, a very good, you know, decent pen to go with it. Um, and I think people are really interested in, in writing, but um, there's the other, um, there's a collaborative through PSU that was graphic novel and comic artists um, combining forces and sort of, um, documenting a houseless person's experience. And I can't remember, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of that, but that would be available through Street Roots. 
but that's a beautiful publication of art and writing and lived stories from people out that, that are living on the streets. So yeah, thank you for that question. That's great. So Laura, as the numbers of, of people living on the streets has increased so dramatically in recent years, how has that changed what you do? Are you trying to meet the need and increase the, the number of libraries that you have get out there or? Yeah, that's a great question. Man, I would say what a bleak stretch of a couple of years, right? I mean, I think I feel like we're just kind of all dusting ourselves up and standing up and looking around at what we just survived. And that's and that's those of us who have a safe spot to sleep, right? Um, and so it's all the more profound for folks who have really been extra vulnerable. Um, I would say there are a number of um, initiatives in the city and they're around building village models to, you know, immediately mitigate the harm for people and get them off the sidewalk or out of a tent and into something that is a little more protective, like a small, a tiny home model. Um, and we are definitely in touch with a variety of places as they establish those so that we can provide the books and, and potentially a librarian. And one of the things that we um, were able to do during the pandemic was start an immediate um, sort of micro revenue by hiring a person living at each of the villages um, as the li library liaison. So we were able to compensate them for collecting requests and then we'd have a librarian make a delivery um, once a week uh, of those books. So I don't, it's funny, I don't wanna put Robin Schaffler on the spot, but Robin's here and she's my board president with Street Books. And I know she's been working with um, a safe rest village uh, that will go in in her neighborhood. Are you there, Robin? Do you mind? Do you want to say something about one of the? Will you unmute me? Yeah. 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 yeah sorry, our our setup here is a little bit complicated. Um, yeah, a safe rest village that I hope will come in to uh, the Multnomah Village area. It's very controversial, as uh, one could imagine. But um, yeah, that's our. That's our hope is that we'll be able to support uh, having a library at a safe rest village. And I think I have lots of neighbors who would be happy to, to help out and maybe uh, su certainly supply that library in our local independent bookstore. Any Blooms would help us with that. And um, we're, we're excited about that possibility. It's gonna be a long road to get there because it's very complicated as you can well imagine. Hey, Laura, since you called me out, though, I wanted to ask you to say some things about how, what street books, some of the things that street books did during the real shutdown times of pandemic, because I, I just was stunned at what the, the street books folks who are out on the street were able to do to, to keep things going when everything was shut down. And gradually, we ended up having a street library still active once, yeah. once we figured out how. So say a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, thanks, Robin. I would just say, uh, and thank you for just being called out of the mute uh, <laughs> into talking. Um, I would say, you know, initially when, when the pandemic hit, it, we were sort of stunned like everyone. And we had to really think about what that meant for, for gathering people together. Because of course the magic of street books is being able to gather together in a group and know one another in a way that is, doesn't usually happen on the city streets, especially if somebody is living out there, right? And so we, um, we decided that we would continue to dispatch librarians, but we'd put them on their own bikes and not have the bike library that had everybody gather. And that way we, we equipped librarians with um, small either backpacks or books so that they could approach one-to-one -one people that were outside. Um, and take requests, which was a key part of, of keeping that running, that relationship. Um, we also just had to switch up and we, we distributed hand sanitizer, we distributed um, face masks as those things began, began to be uh, required or recommended as the CDC you know, issued various um, bits of information for the, for the public. Um, I, we had librarians that went out during wildfires and wore gas masks on their bikes. Um, it was really incredible. But I think we also, we were so aware of 
how the closure of most public spaces really profoundly affected our patrons because it was like the one bright spot for a person might have been the daily sitting in the Multnomah County Central Library and reading the newspaper, right? And then that was that was several hours and sitting in relation to people, if not with people. Um, and all of those spaces closed. And so we had the weird distinction, this little scrappy art project library of being the only library open in the city of Portland for a time <laughs> until they switched to kind of an online, you know, put in your order online, pick it up at the window. But of course, most of our patrons were not in a position to take advantage of that. And really that the, it was the public space and the camaraderie that um, had been so important to people Anyway, so so those are those are some of the things that we did, um, and we also just were able to bond with fellow mutual aid organizations. And you know, one of the um, shifts that we run right now is in North Portland, and it's in conjunction, in collaboration with a food a meal that's prepared every Wednesday in the square. And so Diana and Sophie are the librarians for that shift, and they've become really like a part of that family. And so. Several times when the, the lunch person wasn't able to be there, they filled in and ran lunch. And I think that that's the, you know, people talk about being, where, being aware of or beware of mission creep and doing too many things. But I think during the pandemic, you know, we were, we, it was masks and hand sanitizer. And, you know, my kids helped me um, manage one of the hygiene stations, which was a very DIY effort from one of our staff members, Monica Beamer, because people were told to wash their hands, but they had nowhere to wash their hands, of course. And so um, we had a, you know, a big water dispenser and Dr. Bronner's soaps that we were putting out and really trying to keep that stock. So, yeah, so I think that that was very inspiring. It was exhausting, but it was also like in the hopelessness of this suspended animation of pandemic, it was something we could do, which was really a relief, you know, um, for sure. Hodge, do you want to add anything to that? You probably have. Yeah, some you overlooked the, the CEIC who would, they're out on the streets anyway, and they would swing by the office on Tuesdays and get a small box of books. And they said the patrons just love getting the book. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 East Side uh, Industrial Cooperative. It's actually a police. Or, yeah, yeah. Explain, Laura, explain CEIC or Hodge, explain CEIC to people who don't know. It's I'm still not sure what to think of them. <laughs> I don't know if they're, they're out hassling people or if they're, as they say, you know, compassionate care, but they were passing out books, so give them at least that much. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting thing. It's Central East Side Industrial Council, and various social service agencies had kind of butted heads with them sometimes because they are business minded. They are, let's open back the businesses, let's have clean sidewalks. And sometimes they bumped into one another. I think. I mean, this is my own personal philosophy. We need to be working together as much as we can. And I always feel like somebody that is really mean to a houseless person or writes a vicious trolley thing it has just not seen the full story yet. They're just about to be, you know, they're just about to have understanding. So I always view it that way. I don't take offense if somebody is really mean about it or less than, um, than generous, but, um, the, basically, they, the Central East Side Industrial Council approached us when the pandemic hit and said, how are you guys doing? What are you still able to do? And can we help get books out? And so this was Northwest enforcement through them usually was, um, you know, a, a security arm or, or um, you know, uh, I don't know if they ever put, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know the particulars, but basically they changed it up as well and they were distributing supplies as well as books. And so that has turned into a pretty important collaboration. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad for it. I, one of our kind of key philosophies is saying yes, and then doing our best to do it and not being stingy, you know, if we can. So Alicia, this, this burst into a big street books party. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> I have another question. Oh, yeah. Go, Laura. Forgive me if I've asked you this before. I know it started as an art project. Is it still an art project? 
Well, that's such a great question. And I, it's something that I think about because at various times I've thought like, you know, an art project, the best one, I mean, the, the ones that you get funded and are officially art projects usually require some public component where you present your findings or you present the art or the, what you've made. And I remember that um, Regional Arts and Culture Council funded that first summer, so which was a very big deal. And I feel so grateful because that was one of those ideas that was like, it seems kind of crazy. Should I even do this? But when they give you some money to do it, then you're really on the hook for it. Um, and so we had that, we had the reception and um, such a cool and interesting mix of my patrons came and also um, you know, the larger community that were curious and wanted to support. And so we had that and that was supposed to be the conclusion. And, and I think one thing I talk about in the book is on my supposed last week when I biked up, I realized Keith returned books and took new ones out and said, all right, I'll see you next week. And I just thought, I can't, I can't depart from this. And so I think since then, over the years, I've thought, is this like, how do you end an art project? And then I realized that this was, this was not an option anymore just to hang up. It had legs and people were supporting it and team members came and joined. And, and so in my mind, it is very much an art project more than it is a nonprofit with all the grueling things. And, you know, Terry alluded to that is maybe wading into the thicket of what it means to be a 501c3. And I am still very wary of some of the things. It's, I'm, not as, I'm not as good at some things as I am at other, as others. Um, but for me, it's an art, it's an art project. And it became, you know, it, it brought, um, it was a social practice art project designation, bringing people together on a city street. And it was using people and conversation as medium and creating this intersection. And so, yeah, thank you for that question. That's very much how I still think about it. And maybe that helps keep it fresh. And, and Robin and Hodge can speak to the fact that I continue to pitch further and further outlandish ideas and they have to sometimes rein it back. But it's, yeah, thank you. That's a good, good question. Literature is art and we're spreading it around. So yes, we are still an art project. Yeah, what Hodge said. Well, I was kind of wondering about those other projects. Would you mind speaking to what some of the other ideas you've had are? Yeah, well, I mean, I, it's funny because, um, and I think my brother had to bail, but before he, um, before the Street Books Project, James had helped me. I got a grant from PSU and I made a giant rolling gallery really with plexiglass windows and um, invited PSU students to, to um, contribute their precious objects um, for display. And then because I love typewriters, I had these beautiful fold out kind of benches with an old royal typewriters on either side and invited just passersby to reflect and then to sit down and write um, about their own precious objects. And so James helped me build that thing and it was so unwieldy. And I think he was relieved when I started sketching out what a street library could look like because he realized it was about half the size and, um, and he really did um, help me, you know, fill it with chicken feed at the time we had a bunch of chickens and um, take it for a spin to make sure it was roadworthy and wasn't gonna kill anyone. And fortunately I'm knocking on wood, but we have not had any terrible mayhaps since then or mishaps. Mayhaps might be what's ahead of us. Um, yeah, but that, so that, that was one, that was the rolling um, library. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've been doing stuff like that. I worked as a temp at the post office when my husband and I first moved to Portland and I made a yearbook for everyone. We were all just the weirdest disparate gathering of people, but I realized I really, I collected a, you know, a Polaroid of each of them, their hobbies. I made a sort of um, crossword puzzle that was composed of zip codes and quizzes. I mean, it was very nerdy, but uh, so I realized that I had been making stuff like that for a while when I when it occurred to me that maybe someone would give a grant for it. That was the, the, the light bulb, so, yeah. Man, I just feel so, thank you for coming. I, I um, am, am pretty thrilled to see <laughs> um, 
This is Brooke, and this is worth commenting. Thank you, Laura Hodge and Street Books. Portland is lucky to have you. Um, and maybe I can just give Brooke a shout out because Brooke gave us, invited us to um, do a short feature in AARP magazine. Imagine when I qualified to my horror for um, ARP magazine. I'm just kidding. Uh, it was great. And, um, and Brooke did such a beautiful job and it helped us get such a range of new supporters and interest across the states. So thank you. I haven't ever seen what you look like. It's really fun to see you. I, I just wanted to tell you that I must have pitched about a hundred stories to AARP and yours was one of five that they actually permitted me to write. So wow. Yeah. Like that. That, that's just a testament to how special Street Books is. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. It's so fun to see your face and meet it, you. It's great to see you and Hodge and everybody else. Yeah, thank, thank you. And you're on the East Coast, right? So it's late for it's you. It's late. It's almost 11 o'clock in New York. Wow. Thank you for coming. This is fun. It's like the game show where they bring who's your, what's your life? Who's your member when they, I, I don't even remember, but Hodge. This remember. is your life. This is your life. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Hodge, do you have, well, we should ask with the last couple minutes, if anybody has a last question. I would or, like to say thank you all for your interest and thank you for your response. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, um, we, our, um, we have a, a great little website, streetbooks.org. Um, and you can always, you can write, if you're not getting a, an occasional newsletter from us and you wanna kind of keep up with what we're doing on the street and see photos and um, learn about patrons, you can do that. You can sign up on the website or just write me an email, librarian at streetbooks.org. Um, yeah, and so, you can kind of follow us and, and um, connect that way. Well, can I ask one more question? Yeah, do it. Um, how's your, how's Street Book's relationship with Multnomah County Library? I know a lot of times it's, it's good, but what's, how's it going now? You know, we, we have gotten, uh, pre-pandemic, they were providing a couple of curated boxes a month for us, which was very cool. They have outreach services so they are often, if they can get volunteers, they um, are filling like the shelves at a shelter, for example, and that sort of thing. But we, we had the very first summer that I was out there, I can't remember how Jeff Brunk with Multnomah County heard about us, but he brought like three boxes of perfect, like Louis L'Amour, everything that we really wanted. I think he'd seen on the website um, some information. And my heart sank because I was on the bike. And so then I had three boxes, but I made it work. I just thanked him and took them graciously. And then when he was gone, I was like, oh no, but it worked. And, um, but I would say, um, Vailey, we know um, Vailey, the director of Multnomah County, um, who's been super generous and bought loaners copies for the library. And um, so we don't have an official um, relationship. We're a little bit more renegade, I think, than a, a system that is so big. But I also love them like crazy. I mean, I raised my kids on books from the, and that was our sort of whole social outing was just going to the library and back. So um, so I think they're an amazing system in our city and a huge resource, yeah. And there were a fair amount of our checkouts that would inadvertently get returned to the Multnomah Library and they would graciously send them back to it. Yes, thank you for remembering that. That's very mortifying because we, no matter how often we tell our patrons we are not affiliated with the mainstream library, once in a while they'll still return them. And which makes me feel good because I know someone's trying to be super conscientious. They had to make a trip to do that. But then um, people um, have been kind enough to give courtesy returns to our PO box sometimes. So that's super sweet of them. Only once did somebody print off our website hours and operation and highlight it as though we didn't realize that um, they shouldn't be doing that. But we didn't take offense, we just moved on. Yeah. Yeah, well, man, I wanna thank everyone so much. What a sweet group and thank you for the time and attention and really for 
yeah, coming, so many of you are so dear to me and I just can't believe um, that Hodge and I got so lucky. Well, thank you for the project, Laura, and for, you know, sharing your stories, Ben and Laura, and just everybody for coming and supporting as well. It's just, what a great project. And thank you for doing what you do. Because, you know, it's going to take a village to reach everybody, you know, and help everybody. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks again for the invite. Absolutely. Yeah, you're welcome back. And hopefully next time we'll be inside. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have you guys back. We'll do it. We'll come with book number two, which we are uh, joking. Oh, are you? We don't know how much of a joke it is yet, but we're once a week now we're getting together to watch cowboy shows like Bonanza. And I think something good is going to come from it. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep it posted. Yeah, please do. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks again so much. And thank you, Diana. I saw you too. So great. Hmm. You've inspired me to take better notes this summer of what, yes. what I see and what's going on. Yes. And I would love to talk to you again, Terry. Let's let's make a call. We can do a Zoom call even, as unpleasant as they are. I want to, not that they're unpleasant, but yeah. um, they're less than ideal. But um, but let's I would love it. to, yeah, love to connect. Thank you. It means a lot that you came. It's really cool. I have, I have no schedule, so whenever works for you. Okay, that sounds great. All right. Well, I guess that's it for us this evening. Thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.